presume. So, we have to prove this. Cut edge, if and only if uh, not a cyclic edge. Proof. Let E be a cut edge. How do cut edges exactly look like? Uh, cut edge is like a bridge. The idea of a cut edge is exactly like a bridge. That is, if you cut that bridge, then one town on one side of the bridge, other town on the other side of the bridge. Once the bridge is broken, the people from uh, those two towns cannot really communicate. You cannot really traverse from one part to the other. First of all, uh, cut edges cannot be loops, that is very clear. Yeah, I mean, there is no such, <laughs> no question. Loop can never be a cut edge. The removing a loop obviously will not uh, disconnect that graph. It is clear if it is connected. But two different components There cannot be any edge going from here to here, is that uh, because if there was an edge that way, then th these do not become different components. Okay, the fact that I am saying that H1 is a component different from, so there is a component that contains Y, there is a component that contains X, and those two components are different. In edge, we cannot have any edge H1 and H2 that means that uh, bridge that see suppose there was one more bridge then that bridge does not become, it does not become a cut edge. Just because there is only one bridge that, that is what has caused the whole problem. If there is one more bridge, then that bridge and that second bridge, they together will form a cyclic situation. Okay? any cycle of G. What do I have to prove conversely? If he is not on any cycle, then it is a cut edge.
not on any cycle. What happens if E is not a cutage? Then the component that contains X will also contain Y. If That means I could go from x to y and then I can complete that two cycle adding the edge yx to this path on the right of p gives us a cycle a contradiction What does it contradict? It contradicts uh, the fact that E is not on any cycle. We started with the assumption that E is not on any cycle and we <laughs> got in the contradiction that uh, there is a cycle containing it. So that completes the proof uh, of this theorem. As such, if you have uh, a walk, a closed walk, from this vertex back to that vertex, that closed walk, obviously the, as we did, you can remove those humps. You can remove the portions where the vertex gets repeated, they can be removed, therefore you can straighten the thing up. Therefore, if you have a closed walk, it will give us, give rise to a cycle eventually. Is this, is this clear? Closed walk can be of uh, two different types. You can have a, a closed walk of even length or you could have a closed walk of odd length. So, we want to say that if you have a closed walk of uh, odd length, then it contains a cycle of odd length. So, that is uh, exactly what we, that is a statement we are looking for. Let cycle of odd length all right uh, what is the hierarchy here Every cycle is a closed walk. Every cycle of course is a closed walk. Every closed walk is not a cycle. 
Every closed walk is not quite a cycle. What prevents it from being a cycle? Why is it not cycle? Because because you're repeating vertices. Really speaking, except the first vertex, which is equal to the last vertex for a cycle, you should not repeat any vertex. Whereas this will repeat uh, some in between vertex. Okay. If you repeat some in between vertex, really speaking it amounts to saying that you have one portion and another portion. So that walk can be divided into two closed walks. I would be able to divide that walk into two closed walks that have no edge in common with each other at all. One of which must have even length and one of which must have odd length. Why is that? Because the total length is an odd number. These kinds of parity based arguments are extremely common in graph theory. Okay. This is just beginning. Large body of graph theory depends on such kinds of, uh, these are called parity based arguments, even odd business. One of these must have even length and other must have odd length because if both were even, their sum will be an even number which is not true. If both were odd, their sum will be still an even number which is not true. Therefore, exactly one must be even, the other one must be odd. Then one that is odd actually is a sub walk of smaller length and has odd smaller length. Therefore, I could then proceed by induction. If this itself is a cycle, then that is exactly what I am looking for. If it is not a cycle, then inside it I can find another one, etc, etc. Okay? So that is the, <laughs> that is the idea. Let us in fact for a simple graph also. That is a closed walk. I could begin with this vertex coming back to go that way. It is this vertex which is uh, actually repeated so you can look at the portion on the right of uh, this portion on the left the total number of edges which is 4 here 5 here 9 edges on this side 8 edges on that side because there are as many as 17 edges in all <laughs> which is getting divided into two parts one of these numbers and exactly one of these numbers will be an odd number which in this case is the left portion. So, the left portion is an odd walk with length 9 which is a sub walk of that bigger walk. Okay. Then I can focus on this and say that that vertex is repeated. Any vertex which occurs only twice is not repeated. Any vertex which occurs more number of times is repeated. At that vertex, you, the picture splits into two parts. The left part that has four edges, right part that has five edges. Right part is a sub walk. So it is a sub walk of the sub walk. So it is sub walk of the original walk that has five edges and happens to be a cycle. This cannot continue forever because you, you keep getting sub walks of smaller lengths which are odd. Eventually, if your length is equal to 1, and then there is nothing to prove, which is a cycle, <laughs> which is of course a cycle.
So induction will start with odd numbers greater than or equal to 3. So I won't uh, write this proof. I would like you to <laughs> write the <laughs> proof yourself. I, I gave you an idea of uh, how to do it. Okay, proof based proof uh, using induction. Having seen that, what about the version of uh, this lemma for closed walk of even length? Can I make the same statement for even length? A closed walk of even length does it contain a cycle of even length? Yeah, right. Saying no, so a counter example. What would be a counter example? Two loops. Two loops, yes, that's correct. That's in fact the smallest example one can consider. Two loops. Two loops. That's a closed walk of even length. And the only cycle it has, has length 1. There is no cycle of length 2 there. You just don't have any. And then see where does the argument fail. Okay. So that's exactly <laughs> what you should look at. Something that worked for odd, why is it that it did not work for even numbers, etc. Though for even numbers, if your graph happens to be simple, then it should go through. That graph is not simple. Two loops is not a simple graph. In fact, simple graphs have no loops at all with them. No loops, no multiple edges. <coughs> okay, that uh, brings us close to this definition. G is called a bipartite graph. If you have a vertex set here, another vertex set here, this is x, this is y. For any two vertices here, these are not adjacent to each other. No two vertices in x are adjacent to each other. No two vertices in y are adjacent to each other. So all the adjacencies of this graph, if any, they will be across. They will be from x to y or y to x. Okay. Bipartite graphs constitute an important class of graphs because they model many real life situations. As we talked of it yesterday, any kind of uh, matchmaking problem <laughs> is a problem with bipartite graphs. Whenever you have uh, two kinds of uh, uh, two kinds of vertices, okay, the boys constitute one kind of vertices, girls constituting another kind of vertices and the matchmaker's job. So the adjacencies are only between boys and girls, presuming that to be the case. Then uh, what, what you have is a bipartite graph situation. Or job seekers and jobs, applicants and jobs, uh, or students seeking admissions in colleges and the colleges. 
etc. So all these can be modeled with bipartite graphs. The definition here is quite general. Uh, yeah, so don't be under the impression that I have to have edges going from x to y. For example, if my graph is null graph on 10 vertices, then it is bipartite. Is that clear? Because there is nothing to check. I don't have to check anything at all. The requirement here is there be no edges from any vertex in x to any vertex in x, nor any vertex in y to any vertex in y. In particular, bipartite graphs cannot have loops because then you will have vertex in x adjacent to itself. Okay. Right. So, good thing with bipartite graphs is that you do not have cycles of length 1 <laughs> because there are no loops. There could be cycles of length 2 that is a cycle of length 4. As I see if I have to draw a cycle here then I start at the vertex in x, I go to a vertex in y, I come back to the vertex in to a vertex in x, again go to a vertex in y. So it is sort of a ping pong kind of thing x to y, x, y, x, y and then back to x. What that means is the total number of edges in such a thing will be an even number, it will be an even number whether it is 2, 4 or 6 or 8 or 10, whatever. So bipartite graphs cannot have cycles of odd length. Okay. So let us write that as a lemma. that order. <coughs> Z1 is in X, therefore Z2 will have to be in Y. Is that clear? That is the And because Z2 is in Y, Z3 will have to be in X. ZR is adjacent to Z1. it must be in Y. Because the first vertex is in X. So the last vertex must be in Y. So R is an even number. Among the graphs that we looked at yesterday, there is one, one particular graph which is bipartite. 
which one was it which actually is a bipartite graph yesterday i gave number of examples of graphs is one particular example where the graph e is bipartite huh claw yes yes anything else huh a chessboard is also an example of a bipartite chessboard well chessboard meaning the vertices are the squares on the yeah the square and you connect them in the nearest neighbor way you start the white one you connect okay the natural adjacencies yes. the grid yes. yes what is saying is that's fine yes no to yeah the color them alternately as he is saying that's a good example take the usual 8 by 8 chess board okay any n by n. yeah or any n by n yeah a white square is adjacent to a black square to only to black squares that is the way alternate coloring tells you so all the white squares white cells on a chess board they are in x all the black cells are in y and the adjacencies are only between white and black okay therefore uh, that is an example of a bipartite graph there is a bipartition yes yesterday there was one particular example there you remember it the cube graph that i had drawn yesterday the graph of a cube is a bipartite graph can i try to construct a bipartition let's see how we can <laughs> do that let's put one here one is adjacent to two one is also adjacent to four one is adjacent to five so they have to be in y One three six eight yes two four five seven okay so this is a bipartite graph with that bipartition yeah well, well, yes <laughs> slowly <laughs> thank you so this is bipartite okay draw the bipartite picture for this graph when you go home what about the path is path bipartite yes how alternately this should go in x this should go in x this should go in. what about an even cycle cycle with even is this bipartite that's true the property of being bipartite is hereditary property what does that mean if a graph is bipartite then any subgraph of that is also bipartite because it will have the same properties it will have because if i take a subgraph of this what does the subgraph uh, amount to 
subgraph amounts to picking up some vertices from here, some vertices from here, maybe re you remove some edges. So x, x dash or x prime will be a subset of x. And because the adjacencies are only between x to y, the adjacencies here will also be between only from x prime to y prime. Therefore, if g is bipartite, so is the subgraph. Any subgraph of a bipartite graph, bipartite. Okay. Yes. If you take it, uh, no, uh, the argument still works. I mean, wha what you are saying is in that case y prime is empty. Yeah, it's, it's a null graph. It's a null graph. Then the graph on x prime will also be null. It is by definition. Okay, this is a good question. <laughs> Look at the definition we have. G restricted to x is null graph. By definition, it's part of definition. Therefore, G restricted to X prime will also be a null graph. Null graphs are bipartite because there's nothing to check. There's absolutely nothing to check. I can form bipartition in any manner I want to. Null graphs are yes. Isolated graphs. No, what does that mean? No, what does that mean? Empty graph meaning no vertices at all? No, no vertices at all is not a very good situation. Okay. I mean, you have to have at least one vertex and no vertices at all. Well, graph with no vertices, one can talk about it, but there is not much point in doing that. Yeah, graph with no edges makes sense. Graph with no vertices at all, not really. Is that clear? So it doesn't really matter. Subgraph of a bipartite graph is bipartite. What about an odd cycle? In fact, we proved here. This is already proved here in this lemma. So, odd cycles cannot be bipartite. Therefore, it does look like if you do not have odd cycles, then your graph should be bipartite, which is actually converse of converse statement of this. So, let us write it out and prove it. One part of this I already proved. That is that lemma. If G is bipartite, then every cycle in G is an even cycle. So you cannot have odd cycles. Let G have no odd cycles. Now this is a more difficult thing. <laughs> I have to produce a bipartition now. To say that the graph is bipartite, actually I have to produce some bipartition. I must be able to write the vertex at V as a union, as a disjoint union like this. 
So this is not a completely trivial thing. This lemma, the proof was uh, essentially a ping pong kind of argument that we made. Okay, this is exactly like a table tennis kind of argument. X Y X Y. <laughs> okay. Here we remaining part you really need to produce a bipartition. First of all, let's see that uh, if your graph is not connected, suppose your graph has two components and if you show that both of these components are bipartite, can I then say that the original graph is bipartite? Yes, because suppose G consists of two parts. This is the part G1. What that thing is saying is there is a partition here x1, y1. All the edges go only from x1 to y1. If there are edges, they go only from x1 to y1. Similarly, for G2, the edges only go from x2 to y2. Then I can take x to be the union x of x1 and x2, y to be union of y1 and y2 then the edges will go only from x to y okay in fact there is nothing unique about this i could have to, i i could take union of x1 and y2 if i want to i mean though it's not really required i could do it in many ways <laughs> okay and more components i have there is more freedom in handling this etc okay therefore if i can prove so the statement that is given is g has no odd cycles that is what we are assuming. Therefore, G1 has no odd cycles. G2 also has no odd cycles. The difference between G and G1 is that G1 is connected. So, suppose I start with a connected graph with no odd cycles and I prove that it is bipartite, then by this kind of pasting operation, I can complete the proof. Okay? Therefore, that statement needs to be proved only for connected graphs with no odd cycles. First, And if each GI with bipartition XI, YI to be a bipartition. where x is the union, disjoint union so what all this means is it is enough to prove that statement for connected graphs with no odd cycles that's what we'll do Standard way of saying that is without loss of generality, <laughs> we can take G to be connected. WLOG thus. There is a general definition that I want to make now. Given a 
of a shortest UV path. Distance from U to V. Distance is an important idea. What is the distance uh, between U and V? 2. There is also a path this way whose length is 3, but you take the shorter one. The shorter path need not be unique. There are two short distance paths here, both of which have length 2. So the distance between U and V is 2. When is distance between U and V equal to 1? When U and V are adjacent, when U and V are adjacent to each other, U V is an edge, then the, the distance between U and V is equal to 1. What if there is no path at all from U to V, then I take distance between U and V to be infinity. Okay? There is a, just to say that the, you cannot really go from U to V. So if U and V belong to different components, then the, the distance between them is infinite. Fortunately, what we are doing here is we are taking G to be connected. Therefore, that DUV will be, it will be a positive number. What is distance between U and, what is the distance between V and V, the same vertex 0. Okay? Path of length 0. <coughs> distance here actually is a metric. It is a metric. Check that when <laughs> you go home. It's just the triangle inequality that needs to be checked. So if distance between V1 and V2 is something and distance between V2 and V3 is something else, then distance between V1 and V3 is less than or equal to distance between V1 and V2 plus distance between V2, V3. Fix. Then, because every vertex has to have even distance or odd distance from x0, from the reference point. There is no vertex that is not reachable from x0 because we are assuming that the graph is connected. We are assuming that the graph is connected. x0 is in x because its distance from x0 is 0. 0 is an even number. What does that mean? There is a x0 to v path whose length is e1. There is x0 to w path whose length is e1. If vw was an edge, then
even number of edges. If there was an edge, if there was an edge from V to W, suppose then what is it that I can do? From X0 I can go to V using P. From V I can go to W using that edge E. And then from W I can go back to X0 using the reverse of that path P prime. W to X0 path which is reverse of then P first P then E and then P double prime juxtaposition one after the other E is x0 to x0 walk that is a closed walk whose length what would be the length of this it will be an even number plus 1 plus an even number which is an odd number ok whose length is odd Is it clear? E1 plus 1 plus E1 is odd. Therefore, we have a closed walk of odd length. We proved that if you have a closed walk of odd length, then there is a cycle of odd length. odd cycle a contradiction why did this contradiction arise it arose because we assume that vw is an edge so vw cannot be an edge exactly the same argument will work in case V and W are here. You see I will get a path from X0 to V whose length is odd. I will get a path from X0 to W whose length is also odd because V and W belong to Y means X0 to V length of the path is odd, X0 to W length of the path is odd. Therefore this P will be odd length P double prime will also, P prime will be odd length, therefore P double prime will be all odd length. If I assume that VW is an edge, then it will be odd plus 1 plus odd, which is an odd number. <laughs> and therefore you get a closed odd walk, implying that we have a odd cycle, which is contradiction. Okay. Similarly, now when I write similarly here, you should complete the proof. <laughs> it's your job, write that paragraph four or six lines, whatever. If hence is 
the bipartition. Because inside x, such a thing is called an independent set. When you have no edges between any two vertices of that set, such a set of vertices is called an independent set. So x is an independent set, y is also an independent set. There are two independent sets. I edges, if at all, are between x and y. They are only between x and y. This theorem is a remarkable theorem. Uh, it's remarkable in the sense that suppose I have to check if if my given graph is bipartite or is not bipartite. If I have to prove that it is bipartite, look at the definition, then I have to produce bipartition. Producing a bipartition at times as we did for the case of cube graph can be actually quite a difficult task. Actually producing a bipartition could be quite a difficult thing. Whereas checking if there is an odd cycle or no odd cycle is easy. In actuality there are, it is essentially very, very elementary job. What kinds of uh, cycles your graph has, if it has an odd cycle can be checked by writing very easy computer programs on that graph, even if the inputs are quite high. So that is not asking for you to produce a bipartition actually. You just check that there is no odd cycle. Once you know that there is no odd cycle, you are sure that uh, the graph is bipartite. So checking that uh, graph has no odd cycle, as soon as you hit upon an odd cycle, you know that the graph is not bipartite. Therefore the outcome of this whole thing is uh, that uh, bipartiteness checking for graph uh, as a problem in graph theory is an easy question. It is an easy question in terms of algorithms. In terms of complexity of algorithm, this is an easy question. It is much easier to check whether the given graph is bipartite or is not bipartite. In a reasonable time, you can, you can come out with an answer. Say that you just check if it has an odd cycle and th that is very easy task. Without this theorem, it would have been very difficult. If somebody tells you, no, it is not bipartite, how would you, and the only way to argue against it is actually produce a bipartition, <laughs> which at times could really become quite difficult. Okay, so we'll stop here for today. Work out the exercises. Yeah, thank you.